Aloha and good evening. This is Edwin Boyat, and it is time once again to read through the Enchiridion by Epictetus. This is a relatively short length document. It is or was written or organized as a, a manual, a handbook. That is what Enchiridion means. It was actually put together by one of the students of Epictetus. As you can see, it's coming home almost 1900 years old. But you're going to see there's a lot of interesting, useful material here. Now, whether you are a, an aspiring Stoic, you're interested in philosophy, or you are just leading a self-reflective life, and you're curious about the decisions you make, the way you think about your relationship to other people, the things that happen to you in the world, what is, what is your place in the world, and how to approach the world, the Enchiridion is a fantastic document. Now, I am, I am not a, a Stoic by any stretch of the imagination, but I certainly embrace certain Stoic ideas, and I think there's, there's some concepts in here that are worth having in your toolbox for life. All right, so let's go through this and let's let Epictetus speak for himself. There's a couple of things in here that are challenging to hear, and there's a couple of a couple of bits in here I just absolutely love. I will point those out to you as we go. All right, this is the Elizabeth Carter translation, and you can read along. I've put the link to this particular translation that is on the MIT.edu website. I put it in the description to the video. I'm going to go ahead and paste it right into the chat also, make it super easy. Read along. If you can't read along right now, do so when you get the chance. Everyone should read the Enchiridion at least twice. It's that good. That good and probably that significant. All right. The first concept you're going to get right from the get-go is something called the dichotomy of control. And the thing that's going to jump out at you, or the thing that is asserted, the, the stoic assertion here, is that some things are in your power and some things are not. Understanding what is in your power and what is not, the Stoics assert, is one of the keys to living a peaceful life, obtaining fulfillment, ataraxia, if you will, <laughs> living conformably to nature. All right, so with no further ado, here we go. Some things are in our control. Others not. Things in our control are opinion, pursuit, desire, aversion, and in a word, whatever are our own actions. So again, this, this quartet of things here. Opinion, pursuit, that is moving closer to something. Desire and aversion. And in a word, whatever are our own actions. Things not in our control, our body, property, reputation, command, and in one word, whatever are not our own actions. Now, why, why should this be important to us? Well, here we go. The things in our control are by nature free, unrestrained, unhindered. But those not in our control are weak, slavish, restrained, belonging to others. Remember then that if you suppose the things which are slavish by nature are also free, and that what belongs to others is your own, then you will be hindered, you will lament, you will be disturbed, and you will find fault both with gods and men. But if you suppose that only to be your own, which is your own, and what belong, belongs to others, such as it really is, then no one will ever compel you or restrain you. Further, you will find fault with no one or accuse no one. 
You will do nothing against your will. No one will hurt you. You will have no enemies and you will not be harmed. Aiming, therefore, at such great things. At such great things. And that is, again, that is shifting your focus, shifting your mental model to focusing only on the things that are by nature free, unrestrained, and unhindered. (laughs) Aiming, therefore, at such great things. Remember that you must not allow yourself to be carried even with a slight tendency towards the attainment of lesser things. Instead, you you must entirely quit some things and for the present postpone the, the rest. But if you would both have these great things along with power and riches, then you will not even gain the latter, because you aim at the former too. But you will absolutely fail of the former, by which alone happiness and freedom are achieved. All right. And so when you're reading something, it's always important to understand who it's being written here, written here for. And I, I think it's pretty safe to assume that this is sort of written for Stoic students and someone who's aiming at this comprehensive model. OK. Work, therefore, and this is probably something that all of us should pay attention to. Because we have been conditioned to form opinions like like that. And if you, in your leisure, when you have time to reflect, think about your experiences with people and perhaps even yourself. And sometimes the strength of our opinions or the strength of people's opinions is inversely correlated inversely correlated with their actual amount of knowledge about something. So the less knowledge and the more emotion someone has, the more strongly committed to that opinion they may be. You can examine that assertion and see if see if that holds true for you. In the live audience, in the live audience, Elizabeth says, man, Dune got a whole lot heavier than I remember from the last time I read it. <laughs> I also, when I'm not reading philosophy, I love, I love reading certain landmark and fun books. It's some, some that are important, but maybe, maybe not fun. We're currently reading 1984 Dune, and we're also reading the Redwall series by Brian Jakes. And we do these things called story times, and it is just an immense amount of fun. So not stoic at all. Right, I'm, I'm reading what is nominally a young adult or a children's book, but it is great stuff. Um, particularly, it is Redwall is definitely a a virtue study. <laughs> All right, let me get back into the philosophy. Work, therefore, to be able to say to every harsh appearance, "You are but an appearance, and not absolutely the thing you appear to be." And then examine it by these rules which you have, and first and chiefly by this, whether it concerns the things which are in our own control or those which are not. And if it concerns anything not in our control, be prepared to say that it is nothing to you. All right. Again, going back to that dichotomy of control, particularly here with appearances and opinions. And there's that, that statement right there, we could parse for quite a bit. We won't stretch it out too much. But just understand that even if we have an accurate perception of something, our, our, our mental model of something, our concept of it, right, at best is a pale reflection of reality and is not reality itself. And our emotions will certainly cloud the accuracy of that, of that whatever flawed perception or appearance we have. All right, continuing on. Remember the following. Desire promises the attainment of that of which you are desirous, and aversion promises the avoiding to that which you are averse. However, he who fails to obtain the object of his desire is disappointed, and he who incurs the object of his aversion, wretched. 
If then you will confine your aversion to those objects only which are the contrary to the natural use of your faculties, which you have in your own control, you will never incur anything to which you are averse. But if you are averse to sickness or death or poverty, you will be wretched. Remove aversion then from all things which are not in our control and transfer it to things contrary to the nature of what is in our control. But for the present, totally suppress desire. For if you desire any of the things which are not in your own control, you must necessarily be disappointed. I am sorry, I've got somebody calling in to me. Let me stop that. <laughs> uh, remove aversion then. And things not in our control. Well, it is for the moment, I guess. I can push that little button. <laughs> but if you are averse to sickness or death or poverty, you will be wretched. Remove aversion then from all things which are not in our control and transfer it to things contrary to the nature of what is our, in our control. But for the present, totally suppress desire. For if you, if you desire any of the things which are not in your own control, you must necessarily be disappointed. And of those which are, and which it would be laudable to desire, nothing yet is in your possession. Again, think about the audience that he's writing here to. Use only the appropriate actions of pursuit and avoidance, and even these lightly and with gentleness and reservation. With regards to whatever objects give you delight, are useful, or deeply loved, remember to tell yourself of what general nature they are, beginning from the most insignificant things. If, for example, you are fond of a specific ceramic cup, remind yourself that it is only ceramic cups in general of which you are fond. Then if it breaks, you will not be disturbed. If you kiss your child or your wife, say that you only kiss things which are human, and thus you will not be disturbed if either of them dies. Now, it's probably not surprising that a lot of the, a lot, a lot of the Stoics may have been bachelors. <laughs> and romantic love did not have the uh, the pri priority that it does now. Some of the the love of attachment. Number four, when you're going about any action, remind yourself what nature the action is. If you're going to bathe, and I always like to give this explanation here. Here, remember uh, where, where he's writing this from. So Epictetus was a slave and was ex educated in Rome. Uh, in Rome by a Stoic philosopher called uh, Musonius Rufus. Great stuff. He's written some really great stuff. We'll read that some too. A lot of the Stoics are pretty pretty hard men. Um, anyway, they got exiled from Rome. One of the emperors said, you know what, you, you philosophers, you're always making all kinds of trouble. You guys need to beat it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Epictetus went to uh, went to uh, a, a town in Western Greek, a relatively young town, a place called uh, Nicopolis. And there he had a student called Arian. And, and so Arian's writing the, all this down. So that's where he's writing it. But the takeaway from all that is in Rome and in Greece, you had public baths. So you can almost think of this as, as think of it as a swimming pool slash sauna slash public showers, if you want, okay? So now it'll make more sense. Kind of a roundabout and long way to make it make sense, but it'll be all right. <laughs> You're all stoically enduring my long-winded explanations, right? I know you are. All right, so when you're going about any action, remind yourself what nature the action is. If you're going to bathe, picture to yourself the things which usually happen in the bath. All right, I got my Mr. Bubble. I got my rubber ducky. I'm ready to sing some karaoke. <laughs> All right, I've got it pictured. Some people splash the water. Some push. Some use abusive language. And others steal. 
Thus, you will more safely go about this action if you say to yourself, I will now go bathe and keep my own mind in a state conformable to nature, and in the same manner with regard to every other action. For thus, if any hindrance arises in bathing, you will have it ready to say, It was not only to bathe that I desired, but to keep my mind in a state conformable to nature. And I will not keep it if I am bothered at things that happen. And this is this is kind of one of the, the foundational pillars to the Stoics. Conformable to nature, living conformably to nature, which is one of the reasons, if you look at some of the early Stoic writers uh, like Chrysippus, and we'll, we'll hear about him in a little bit, they studied natural philosophy, physics, nature, science, right? Rudimentary, the, the rudimentary science of the day, they thought the more they knew about nature and the way the universe operated, they could extrapolate that how they could properly live, right? Number five. Number five is very important, I think. Number five can apply to any of us and can be a useful tool for any of us, right? Men are disturbed not by things, but by the principles and notions which they form concerning things, right? Because again, there's the thing itself, right? And there's the all the attachments, the idea that we've constructed about this thing or the things that have occurred and the particular weights and the emotional resonance. So let's do this again. Men are disturbed, not by things, but by the principles and notions which they form concerning things. Death, for instance, is not terrible, else it would have appeared so to Socrates. But the terror consists in our notion of death, that it is terrible. When therefore we are hindered or disturbed or grieved, let us never attribute it to others, right? Our emotions, our emotions. When therefore we are hindered or disturbed or, or grieved, let us never attribute it to others, but to our ourselves, that is, to our own principles. An uninstructed person will lay the fault of his own bad condition upon others. Someone just starting instruction will lay the fault on himself. Someone who is perfectly instructed will place blame neither on others nor on himself. So in the live studio audience, Elizabeth says some of this, like the uh, admonishment about not worrying about things out of your control, almost sound like they could have come out of one of Paul's letters. So Paul, Paul was a contemporary with some of the Stoics and Paul was a Pharisee's Pharisee. And we know who Paul's teacher was and odds are, not only was Paul trained in the Torah and in Judaic scholarship, but he was probably well trained in philosophy. So Paul would have been well acquainted with Stoicism. But yes, there are there are a lot of parallels. There are definitely a lot of parallels. I think if you go back and read Timothy, it's some of the instructions that Paul is giving Timothy you will see very clear parallels with some of the ideas in Stoicism. All right, continuing on. Don't be prideful with any excellence that is not your own. If a horse should be prideful and say, I am handsome. <laughs> it's, yeah, that's my horse voice. We're going to find later on that these little these little gags and these little little laughs I'm getting, Epictetus is going to scold me for these a little bit further down, but it'll be all right. Don't be prideful with any excellence that is not your own. If a horse should be prideful and say, I am handsome, it would be supportable. But when you are prideful and say, I have a handsome horse, know that you are proud of what is, in fact, only the good of the horse. What then is your own? only your reaction to the appearances of things. Thus, when you behave conformably to nature in reaction to how things appear, you will be proud with reason, for you will take pride in some of your own good. 7. Consider when on a voyage your ship is anchored. 
If you go on shore to get water, you may along the way amuse yourself with picking up a shellfish or an onion. <laughs> this this makes me laugh every time I just, oh, let's go onion gathering. <laughs> However, your thoughts and continual attention ought to be bent towards the ship, waiting for the captain to call on board. You must then immediately leave all these things, otherwise you will be thrown into the ship thou neck and feet like a sheep. So it is with life. If instead of an onion or a shellfish, you are given a wife or a child, that is fine. But if the captain calls, you must run to the ship, leaving them and regarding none of them. But if you are old, never go far from the ship, lest when you are called, you should be unable to come in time. 8. Don't demand that things happen as you wish, but wish they happen as they do happen, and you will go on well. 9. Sickness is a hindrance to the body, but not to your ability to choose. Understand when this was written, they didn't have the same medical models that we had. And, and so you could say, but wait a minute, wouldn't Alzheimer's? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Bear in mind when it was written, but some of it is still germane. Sickness is a hindrance to the body, but not to your ability to choose, unless that is your choice. Lameness is a hindrance to the leg, but not to your ability to choose. Say this to yourself with regard to everything that happens. Then you will see such obstacles as hindrances to something else, but not to yourself. Because you yourself are not the external things outside your control, right? You are your soul and your, your rational faculty. With every accident, number 10, with every accident, ask yourself what abilities you have for making a proper use of it. If you see an attractive person, you will find that self-restraint is the ability you have against your desire. If you're in pain, you will find fortitude if you hear unpleasant language, you will find patience. And thus habituated, thus habituated, the appearance of things will not hurry you away along with them. 11. Never say of anything, I have lost it, but I have returned it. Is your child dead? It is returned. Is your wife dead? She has returned. Is your estate taken away? Well, it is not that likewise returned. But he who took it away is a bad man. What difference is it to you who the giver assigns to take it back? While he gives it to you to possess, take care of it. But don't view it as your own, just as travelers view a, ho a hotel. So over and over again, you're going to see these, this idea of detachment from things that are beyond our control. Right? Twelve. If you want to improve, reject such reasonings as these. If I neglect my affairs, I will have no income. If I don't correct my servant, he will be bad. For it is better to die with hunger, exempt from grief and fear, than to live in affluence with perturbation. It is better your servant should be bad than you unhappy. Begin, therefore, from little things. Is a little oil spilt a little wine stolen, say to yourself, this is the price paid for equanimity, for tranquility, and nothing is to be had for nothing. When you call your servant, it is possible that he may not come, or if he does, he may not do what you want, but he is by no means of such importance that it should be in his power to give you any disturbance. Thirteen. If you want to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid with regard to external things. Don't wish to be thought to know anything. And even if you appear to be somebody important to others, distrust yourself. For it is difficult to both keep your faculty of choice in a state conformable to nature and at the same time acquire external things. But while you are careful about the one, you must of necessity neglect the other. Fourteen. 
Epictetus is, is a blunt fellow. If you wish your children and your wife and your friends to live forever, you are stupid. For you wish to be in control of things which you cannot. You wish for things that belong to others to be your own. So we've circled back up to the idea that was introduced in the very first statement. If you wish your children and your wife and your friends to live forever, you're stupid. For you wish to be in control of things which you cannot. You wish for things that belong to others to be your own. So likewise... If you wish for your servant to be without fault, you are a fool. For you wish vice not to be vice, but something else. But if you wish to have your desires undisappointed, this is in your own control. Exercise, therefore, what is in your own control. He is the master of every other person who is able to confer or remove whatever that person wishes either to have or to avoid. Whoever then would be free, let him wish nothing. Let him decline nothing which depends on others, else he must necessarily be a slave. 15. Remember that you must behave in life as at a dinner party. Is anything brought around to you? Put out your hand and take your share with moderation. Does it pass by you? Don't stop it. Is it not yet come? Don't stretch your desire towards it, but wait till it reaches you. Do this with regard to children, to a wife, to public post, to riches. You will eventually be a worthy partner of the Feast of the Gods. And if you don't even take the things which are set before you, but are able even to reject them, then you will not only be a partner at the Feast of the Gods, but also of their empire. For by doing this, Diogenes, Heraclitus, and others like them, deservedly became and were called divine. Diogenes, we're going to hear more about Diogenes shortly. When you see anyone weeping in grief because his son has gone abroad or is dead, or because he has suffered in his affairs, be careful that the appearance may not misdirect you. Instead, distinguish within your own mind and be prepared to say, It's not the accident that distresses this person, because it doesn't distress another person. It is the judgment which he makes about it. As far as words go, however, don't reduce yourself to his level, and certainly do not moan with him. Do not moan inwardly either. 17. Remember that you are an actor in a drama of such kind as the author pleases to make it. If short of a short one, of long of a long one. If it is his pleasure, you should act as a poor man, a cripple, a governor, or a private person. See that you act it naturally. For this is your business. To act well, the character assigned you. To choose it is another's. 18. When a raven happens to croak unlocally, don't allow the appearance to hurry you away with it but immediately make the distinction to yourself and say, none of these things are foretold to me, but either to my paltry body or property or reputation or children or wife. But to me, all omens are lucky, if I will. For whichever of these things happen, it is in my control to derive advantage from it. 19. You may be unconquerable. If you enter into no combat in which it is not in your own control to conquer. When therefore you see anyone eminent in honors or power, or in high esteem on any other account, take heed not to be hurried away with the appearance, and to pronounce him happy. For if the essence of good consists in things in our own control, there will be no room for envy or emulation. But for your part, Don't wish to be a general or senator or consul, but to be free. And the only way to this, the only way to this is a contempt of things not in our own control. (laughs) Remember that not he who gives ill language or a blow insults, but the principle which represents these things is insulting. When therefore anyone provokes you, 
be assured that it is your own opinion which provokes you. Try, therefore, in the first place not to be hurried away with the appearance. For if you once gain time and respite, you will more easily command yourself. All right? And so here's the question. We react to things. Our, our emotions may out, outrace our, our rational mind. But are you a reasoning man in control of yourself or are you just a collection of reflexes? Are you just a, a collection of just a list of responses? And when the appropriate stimulus has been given, then you will respond like that. So are you a man or are you a convoluted, convoluted machine? <laughs> For if you once gain time and res respite, you will more easily command yourself. 21. All right. He's telling us to train ourselves. Let death and exile and all other things which appear terrible to be daily before your eyes, but chiefly death. And you will never entertain any abject thought, nor too eagerly covert anything. 22. If you have an earnest desire of attaining to philosophy, Prepare yourself from the very first to be laughed at, to be sneered by to be sneered by the multitude, to hear them say, He has returned to us a philosopher all at once, and whence this supercilious look. Now for your part, don't have a supercilious look indeed. <laughs> fix your face, fix your face. From 1,900 years ago, from a Stoic philosopher, he says, fix your face. <laughs> now, for your part, don't have a supercilious look indeed, but keep steadily to those things which appear best to you as one appointed by God to this station. For remember, if you adhere to the same point, those very persons who at first ridiculed will afterwards admire you. But if you are conquered by them, you will incur a double ridicule. 23. This is, this is one you should definitely think about. And I, I think I observe that a lot of people walk around in so much anxiety, so much worry, because there's they're always thinking about, oh, what will people think of me? What will they, if I do this, Will people laugh? Will they do that? What do people think of me, right? Truth of the matter is, most people are so caught up in, in their own stuff, they don't even notice you, right? Unless you're on TikTok setting stuff on fire with a puppy and a girl in a bikini, most people don't even notice you anymore. 23. If you ever happen to turn your attention to externals so as to wish to please anyone, be assured that you have ruined your scheme of life. Be contented then in everything with being a philosopher. And if you wish to be thought so likewise by anyone, appear so to yourself, and it will suffice you. 24. Don't allow such considerations as these distress you. I will live in dishonor and be nobody anywhere. For if dishonor is an evil, you can no more be involved in any evil by the means of another than be engaged in anything base. Is it any business of yours then to get power or to be admitted to an entertainment? By no means. How then, after all, is this a dishonor? And how is it true that you will be nobody anywhere when you ought to be somebody in those things only? Which are your in which are in your own control, in which you may be of the greatest consequence. But my friends will be unassisted. What do you mean by unassisted? They will not have money from you, nor will you make them Roman citizens. Who told you then that these are among the things in our own control, and not the affairs of others? And who can give to another the things which he has not himself? Well, but get them then, that we too may have a share. If I can get them, 
with the preservation of my own honor and fidelity and greatness of mind. Show me the way and I will get them. But if you require me to lose my own proper good, that you may gain what is not good, consider how inequitable and foolish you are. Remember, which would you rather have? A sum of money or a friend of fidelity and honor? Rather assist me then to gain this character and require me to do those things by which I may lose it. Well, but my country, say you, as far as depends on me, will be unassisted. Here again, what assistance is this that you mean? You will not have porticos nor baths of your providing? You now what signifies that? Why, neither does a smith provide it with shoes or a shoemaker with arms. It is enough if everyone fully performs his own proper business. And were you to supply it with another citizen of honor and fidelity, would he not be of use to it? Yes. Therefore, neither are you yourself useless to it. What place, then, say you, will I hold in the state? Whatever you can hold with the preservation of your fidelity and honor. <laughs> Which is... <laughs> In the United States, there are very few elected offices that you can hold with the preservation of your fidelity and honor. <laughs> Maybe a volunteer dog catcher. But if by desiring to be useful to that, you lose these, of what use can you be to your country when you are become faithless and void of shame? Here's another important one. <laughs> this is actually a pretty good one. 25. Is anyone preferred before you at an entertainment or in a compliment or in being admitted to a consultation? If these things are good, you ought to be glad that he has gotten them. And if they are evil, don't be grieved that you have not gotten them. Remember that you cannot, without using the same means, which others do, to acquire things not in our own control except to be thought worthy of an equal share of them. For how can he who does not frequent the door of any great man, does not attend him, does not praise him, have an equal share with him who does? You are unjust then, and insatiable, if you are unwilling to pay the price for any of these things which are sold, and would have them for nothing. For how much is lettuce sold? Fifty cents, for instance. If another then paying 50 cents takes the lettuce and you not paying it go without them, don't imagine he has gained any advantage over you. For as he has the lettuce, so you have the 50 cents which you did not give. So in the present case, you have not been invited to such a person's entertainment because you have not paid him the price for which a supper is sold. It is sold for praise. It is sold for attendance. Give him then the value, if it is for your advantage. But if you would at the same time not pay the one, and yet receive the other, you are insatiable and a blockhead. Have you nothing then instead of the supper? Yes, indeed you have. The not praising him, who you don't like to praise. The not bearing with his behavior at coming in. 26. The will of nature may be learned from those things in which we don't distinguish from each other. For example, when our neighbor boy breaks a cup or the like, we are presently ready to say, these things will happen. Be assured then that when your own cup likewise is broken, you ought to be affected just as when another's cup was broken. Apply this in like manner to greater things. Is the child or wife of another dead? There is no one who would not say this is a human accident. But if anyone's own child happens to die, it is presently, alas, I, how wretched am I. But it should be re remembered how we are affected in hearing the same thing concerning others. 27. As a mark is not set up for the sake of missing the aim, so neither does the nature of evil exist in the body. At 28, this is one, if I could draw to your attention, 
if you take nothing else from this, from this whole section, this one would be the one to maybe internalize. If a person gave your body to any stranger he met on his way, you would certainly be angry, right? If somebody pimped you out against your will, you'd probably be pretty upset. And do you feel no shame in handing over your own mind to be confused and mystified by anyone who happens to verbally attack you? Let's read that again. You read this a couple times. Write it down. I wrote it down today myself. I am actually in the process of memorizing this document. And so every day I read a passage of it. And then I try to write it from memory as much as I can. And this is this is a memory technique, right? Trying to write from memory. By, by trying to recall something and then correcting ourselves we can we can definitely we can strengthen and build a lasting memory. So my, my goal over over this year is I'm trying to memorize this. I'm also slowly working on the Gospel of John. I want to, but I want to memorize the Gospel of John, and I want to memorize at least a couple chapters, and I want to memorize this entire document. It might be a a bold goal, but we'll see. I work at it a little bit every morning. Twenty eight. If a person gave your body to any stranger he met on his way, you would certainly be angry and be furious. And do you feel no shame in handing over your own mind to be confused and mystified by anyone who happens to verbally attack you? All right. Think on that. 29. In every affair, consider what proceeds and follows, and then undertake it. Otherwise, you will begin with spirit, but not having thought of the consequences, when some of them appear, you will shamefully desist. I would conquer at the Olympic Games, but consider what proceeds and follows. And then, if it is for your advantage, engage in the affair. You must conform to rules, submit to a diet, refrain from dainties, exercise your body, whether you choose it or not, at a stated hour, in heat and cold. You must drink no cold water, nor sometimes even wine. In a word, you must give yourself up to your master as to a physician. Then, in the combat, you may be thrown into a ditch, dislocate your arm, turn your ankle, swallow dust, be whipped, and after all that, lose the victory. When you have evaluated all this, if your inclination still holds, then go to war. Otherwise, take notice. You will behave like children who sometimes play like wrestlers, sometimes gladiators, sometimes blow a trumpet, and sometimes act a tragedy when they have seen and admired these shows. Thus, you too will be at one time a wrestler, at another a gladiator, now a philosopher, then an orator, but with your whole soul, nothing at all. Like an ape, you will mimic all you see, and one thing after another is sure to please you, but is out of favor as soon as it becomes familiar. Now, this is probably timely, right? Because you, you hop on the internet, you hop on TikTok, you're scrolling around, oh, I'm, I'm checking out this, I'm... I'm looking at cat videos. I'm, oh, five hours. What am I doing? <laughs> like an ape, you mimic all you see, and one thing after another is sure to please you. But is that a favor as soon as it becomes familiar, as soon as the novelty is worn off? For you have never entered upon anything considerately, nor after having viewed the whole matter on all sides, or made any scrutiny into it, but rashly and with a cold inclination. Thus some, when they have seen a philosopher and heard a man speaking like Euphrates, though indeed, who could speak like him, have a mind to be philosophers too. Con consider first, man, what the matter is, 
and what your own nature is able to bear. If you would be a wrestler, consider your shoulders, your back, your thighs, for different persons are made for different things. Do you think that you can act as you do and be a philosopher, that you can eat and drink and be angry and discontented as you are now? You must watch. You must labor. You must get the better of certain appetites. Must quit your acquaintance. Be despised by your servant. Be laughed at those, by those you meet. Come off worse than others in everything. In magistries, in honors, in courts of judicature. When you have considered all these things round, approach, if you please. If, by parting with them, you have a mind to purchase equanimity, freedom, and tranquility. If not, don't come here. Don't like children. Be one while a philosopher, then a publican, then an orator, and then one of Caesar's officers. These things are not consistent. You must be one man, either good or bad. You must cultivate either your own ruling faculty or externals in applying yourself either to things within or without you. That is, be either a philosopher or one of the vulgar. 30. Duties are universally measured by relations. Is anyone a father? If so, it is implied that the children should take care of him, submit to him in everything, patiently listen to his reproaches, his correction. But he is a bad father. Are you naturally entitled, then, to a good father? No, only to a father. Is a brother unjust? Well, keep your own situation towards him. Consider not what he does, but what you are to do to keep your own faculty of choice in a state conformable to nature. For another will not hurt you unless you please. You will then be hurt when you think you are hurt. In this manner, therefore, you will find from the idea of a neighbor, a citizen, a general, the corresponding duties, if you accustom yourself to contemplate the several relations. 31. Be assured that the essential property of piety towards the gods is to form right opinions concerning them as existing. I and as governing the universe with goodness and justice, and fix yourself in this resolution to obey them and to yield to them. And I wonder, <laughs> you have to wonder about making the show of piety here. He may not want to follow too closely in Socrates' <laughs> footsteps. I and is governing the universe with goodness and justice. And I fix yourself in this resolution to obey them and to yield to them and willingly to follow them in all events as produced by the most perfect understanding. For thus you will never find fault with the gods, nor accuse them of neglecting you. And it is not possible for this to be effected any other way than by withdrawing yourself from things not in our own control, and placing good or evil in those only which are. For if you suppose any of the things not in our own control to be either good or evil, when you are disappointed of what you wish, or incur what you would avoid, you must necessarily find fault with and blame the authors. For every animal is naturally formed to fly and abhor things which appear hurtful, and the causes of them, and to pursue and admire those which appear beneficial, and the causes of them. It is impractical, then, that one who supposes himself to be hurt should be happy about the person who he thinks hurt him, just as it is impossible to be happy about the hurt itself. Hence, also, a father is reviled by his son when he does not impart to him the things which he takes to be good. <laughs> when he does not impart to him the things which he takes to be good. And the supposing empire to be, to be good made Polynices and Etiocles mutually enemies. On this account, the husband, the husbandman, the sailor, the merchant, on this account, those who lose wives and children revile the gods. 
for where interest is, there too is piety placed. So that whoever is careful to regulate his desires and aversions as he ought is by the very same means careful of piety likewise. But it is also incumbent on everyone to offer libations and sacrifices and first fruits conformably to the customs of his country. <laughs> Manuel Lopez says, Edwin, drink a glass of hot water. Yeah, I may be getting a little bit parched. <laughs> There's only a couple more. There's only a couple more that I wanna that I wanna I wanna catch. We're running a little bit long. But again, I strongly encourage you to read through this yourself, right? And return to it a couple of times. And if something is worth is worth incorporating it, incorporate it. But think about why it may or may not. All right, number 33. <laughs> number 33. You remember I told you that that Epictetus would would scold me as we got a little bit further into the document for the little my my enjoyment at laughing at some of the passages. Here we go. It's time for me to get scolded. 33. Immediately pres prescribe some character and form of conduits to yourself, which you, may, which you may keep both alone and in company. Be for the most part silent or speak merely what is necessary or in a few words. We may, however, enter, though sparingly, into discourse, sometimes when occasion calls for it, but not on any of the common subjects of gladiators or horse races or athletic champions or feast, the vulgar topics of conversation, but principally not of men, so as either to blame or praise or make comparisons. If you are able, then, by your own conversation, bring over that of your company to... <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. If you are able then, by your own conversation, bring over that of your company to proper subjects. But if you happen to... Oh. <laughs> I apologize. If you are able then, by your own conversation... Bring over that of your company to proper subjects. But if you happen to be taken among strangers, be silent. Don't allow your laughter to be much, nor on many occasions, nor profuse. Sorry, Epictetus. Huh? Enjoy some laughter. <laughs> Avoid. Well, hang on, hang on. Let me. You remember, body is not in our control. <laughs> so I won't have I won't have aversion to this runny nose or whatever is causing me to sneeze. All right. Avoid swearing if possible altogether, if not as far as you are able. Avoid public and vulgar entertainments. But if ever an occasion calls you to them. Keep your attention upon the stretch that you may not imperceptibly slide into vulgar manners. For be assured that if a person be ever so sound himself, yet if his companion be infected, he who converses with him will be infected likewise. All right? So be careful about the company you keep. Provide things relating to the body no further than mere use is meat, drink, clothing, house, family. But strike off and reject everything relating to show and delicacy. As far as possible before marriage, keep yourself pure from familiarities with women. And if you indulge them, let it be lawfully. Don't therefore be troublesome and full of reproofs to those who use these liberties, nor frequently boast that you yourself don't. 
If anyone tells you that a person speaks ill of you, make excuses about what is said of you, but answer, he does not know my other faults, else he would not have mentioned only these. It is not necessary for you to appear often at public spectacles, but if ever there is a proper occasion for you to be there, don't appear more solicitous for anyone than for yourself, that is, wish things to be only just as they are in him only to conquer who is the conqueror. For thus you will meet with no hindrance, but abstain entirely from declamations and derision and violent emotions. And when you come away, don't discourse a great deal on what has happened, and what does not contribute to your own amendment. For it would appear by such discourse that you were immoderately struck with the show. Just a couple more than I want that I want to I want to catch. All right, here we go. And <laughs> this one is a good one. It's, it's a good. One. In parties of conversation, avoid a frequent and excessive mention of your own actions and dangers. For however agreeable it may be to yourself to mention the risk you have run, let me tell you about my bravery. It is not equally agreeable to others to hear your adventures. Avoid likewise an endeavor to excite laughter. <laughs> For this is a slippery point, which may throw you into vulgar manners, and besides, may be apt to lessen you in the esteem of your acquaintance. Approaches to indecent discourse are likewise dangerous. Whenever, therefore, anything of this sort happens... If there be a proper opportunity, rebuke him who makes advances that way, or at least by silence and blushing and a forbidden look. Show yourself to be displeased with such talk. <laughs> All right. Just a couple more. 38. Again, this, this, is, something, this is something that I, I think is kind of important. Right, your rational faculty. This is kind of where where I align very closely with the Stoics and on some other things. When walking, you are careful not to step on a nail or turn your foot. So likewise, be careful not to hurt the ruling faculty of your own mind. And if we were to guard against this in every action, we should undertake the action with the greater safety. Now, one of the ways I've implemented this for myself, if I'm watching news or some program, I watch it, right? But I watch things in moderation. Um, unless it's something that's, you know, educational about philosophy and then, then I'm kind of voraciously consuming that stuff. But if I'm consuming media, I'm doing it mindfully and doing it in moderation. And I've actually done thing, one thing with news. I do not check news every day. I used to go to, particularly when I, when I used to be very involved in, in politics, I was constantly looking at news and stories that were coming through the wire and hearing people's opinions and passions about this and that. And it's... Um, regardless of the amount of self-control and self-awareness you have, when you inundate yourself with these things, you still have reactions to them, right? There's a process that's still going on in your mind. And when your brain takes in information and it puts it somewhere, if it doesn't put it there in an orderly process and we're not careful about what we, what we feel, feed our spirits with, and feed our brains with, then we may be deforming a rational faculty. So, <laughs> I'm on a, I'm on a news and nonsense diet. I am, I am very cautious and very mindful about the material that I consume. So I try to consume only things that are good and healthy for my spirit and for my mind. Okay. Forty-two. 
this is something that we kind of connected with earlier. When any person harms you or speaks badly of you, remember that he acts or speaks from a supposition of it being his duty. Now, it is not possible that he should follow what appears right to you, but what appears so to himself. Therefore, if he judges from a wrong appearance, he is the person hurt, since he too is the person deceived. For if anyone should suppose a true proposition to be false, the proposition is not hurt, but he who is deceived about it. Setting out then from these principles, you will meekly bear a person who reviles you. For you will say upon every occasion, it seems so to him. I like... Uh, I like number 44 a lot, and this is a good thing to remember. These reasonings are unconnected. I am richer than you, therefore I am better. I am more eloquent than you, therefore I am better. The connection rather is this. I'm richer than you, therefore my property is greater than yours. I am more eloquent than you, therefore my style is better than yours. But you, after all, are neither property nor style. <laughs> ah, it is quite a good one. Here's a strange one. Here's a strange one. I told you we would hear about Diogenes again. This is 47. If you read it and you don't have context for it, you're going to be like, what? What is... What is Epictetus trying to tell me? So let's listen to it. When you have brought yourself to supply the necessities of your body at a small price, don't pique yourself upon it. Nor if you drink water, be saying upon every occasion, I drink water. But first consider how much more sparing and patient of hardship the poor are than we. But if at any time you would inure yourself by exercise to labor, in bearing hard trials, do it for your own sake and not for the world. Don't grab statues, but when you are violently thirsty, take a little cold water in your mouth and spurt it out and tell nobody. All right, so let's break this down a little bit. So, Rome, Greece, 2,000 years ago. If you're forgoing wine and you're just drinking water, you're living ascetically. Right, you're, you're depriving yourself of a of a sensual pleasure or of a luxury. Right, drinking water rather than wine. Right, so don't be telling everyone uh, I drink water. I guess the modern day equivalent to that would be like I'm vegan or I do CrossFit. How do you know somebody does CrossFit? They'll tell you. <laughs> but first, consider how much more sparing and patient of hardship the poor are than we. All right, now here's the next thing. One of the Stoic ideas was to practice to subject yourself to hardships to train that intersection of body and soul, right? Because the the body, you know, what, what, what did Newt Rockne say? Fatigue makes cowards of us all. You know, there's... Physical training can be mental training, and training and habituating ourselves to be able to endure hardships is mental training, even though it takes place in the flesh, right? But if any time you would inure yourself by exercise to labor in bearing hard trials, do it for your own sake and not for the world. Don't grasp statues. Okay, so one of the things that Diogenes, the cynic, was reported to have done was when it was cold or snowy, would be to grab a marble statue and, and hug it, right? Because it would be ice cold. So by hugging the statue, he's having to bear with this, this cold, right? And so that would be the hardship. But there's kind of like a little observation there that's like that's that's kind of very public, you know. You're kind of you're kind of doing that for show, and so that's what don't grasp statues. <laughs> and then again here, but when you are so training yourself, he's saying, okay, 
So you've maybe you've gone for a run, you've been working, and you're violently thirsty. And here, that's what the take a little cold water in your mouth is, and then spit it out and don't tell anybody. So it's like an opportunity to train yourself. But it's kind of like the idea of pray in your closet or don't see your don't let your right hand know your left hand is given charity or vice versa. The idea of doing it for yourself, not doing it for demonstration or not doing it for recognition from other people to say like, oh, look at that guy training himself hard. <laughs> All right. This is a good place. This is a good place to stop because we're an hour in. It's a lot to absorb. Sometimes we have to think about some of the references. Please do. Please do take the time to read all the way through this document. Let it sit on you. Make a couple of notes and then come back in a couple of weeks and read it again. Um, this document has really kind of stood the, the test of time. It's been adopted and adapted by monastic orders, by all different kinds of people, and, and used as kind of a guidebook. In it, I think uh, one, of the, one of the Christian monastic orders, they take out the reference to Socrates and they change it to Paul. <laughs> Other, and, and, and Zeus is stripped out, and rather than gods, it's God, but it's, otherwise it's, it's used almost verbatim. Elizabeth says, the police are coming for Edwin, spreading forbidden stoicism. <laughs> well, that's, that's the crime of stoicism, saying that you, if you choose it, you have control of, you have control of what's happening in between your ears and not somebody else. And I, I could see why that would be outlawed, you know? Why would you want people, why would you want people to think for themselves and to think through their own emotions, their desires, what they value, that would be a dangerous thing. <laughs> because you would you would free you would free people from the manipulation of propaganda, from false desires, from the consumerism of the 21st century. Yeah. I could see why stoicism could be forbidden. Anyway, great place to stop. The link to the document is is right in the description to the video. I, again, please let me encourage you to uh, read through this and enjoy it. Anyway, until we meet again, I hope you all are well. God bless you all. Aloha. Good night.